individuals who uh, are faced with tremendous opposition, encounter many difficulties, yet they remain very faithful and uh, continue to declare the truth of God's Word. And we find that uh, once again here in Acts chapter number 18 as we continue uh, through the life of Paul. Paul is now on his second missionary journey, and uh, he has uh, most recently been in Athens, uh, Greece. He had to flee uh, Thessalonica and Berea. Those were located up uh, in northern Greece. They actually, uh, Paul took a boat, sailed all the way down to Athens, about 300 miles away, ministered there for a time. Those who were ministering with him had been left behind uh, back in the city of Berea, and as soon as Paul arrived in Athens, he told them uh, to come immediately. Athens was a city that was completely given to idolatry and uh, was a city where uh, historians have said uh, that it was easier to find a god than it was a man. And uh, Paul, when he saw that, took an opportunity and began to testify to those who were there based on an inscription that he had read to the unknown god. And he said, this god that you don't know about, I want to tell you about him. And of course, we know him to be the God. And uh, they, as soon as they heard of the resurrection and the concept of that God would raise his son, they laughed and began mocking him. And after this, then Paul, and there were some who still were saved through this ministry. And then Paul is uh, now going to travel west uh, across a little piece of land that we call an isthmus to the city of Corinth. Corinth is located on a peninsula. Water surrounds three sides of it. And uh, it had then three harbors that uh, proved to be uh, very beneficial and actually made it a very significant city. Uh, it was able to take the commerce from both the east and the west and, and be able to ship it both directions. The ancient city had been destroyed about 200 years or so before Paul had uh, come here, but by the time Paul reached the city, it was uh, already a relatively new city, one that had been uh, for the most part, rebuilt and was one that was very uh, quite populated. Many of them uh, were men who came from Rome, and we'll see some of those uh, in just a little bit. Very influential, a very important city. Uh, it became the Roman seat of government for Achaia. Uh, that is the region that is in southern Greece and uh, was made up of a mixed population. We'll see Paul ministering to all of them, uh, Romans, Greeks, and the Jews, uh, very wealthy and uh, known for uh, a lot of immorality, known for a lot of wickedness. Paul, I believe, as we begin in what we'll cover this morning, it seems as though Paul anticipated uh, having a short stay. Paul is going to receive a vision according to verse number 9 that instructs him to stay there. Uh, God has many people in this city and Paul was to continue ministering there. It wasn't going to be easy. It wasn't easy for him. And Paul ended up remaining in this city for about 18 months. But I want to begin in verse number 1 of Acts chapter 18 and notice a friendship begun. The Bible says, after these things, Paul departed from Athens and came to Corinth and found a certain Jew named Aquila, born in Pontus, lately come from Italy, with his wife Priscilla, because that Claudius had commanded all Jews to depart from Rome and came unto them. And because he was of the same craft, he abode with them and wrought, for by their occupation they were tent makers. Uh, Aquila was, and these are going to be two individuals that are actually going to now be introduced to us here. Uh, Paul will send them greetings in the uh, end of the book of Romans, which is nearing the end of his life. And so it becomes very clear that the friendship that's begun here in Corinth was a friendship that actually lasted throughout Paul's remainder of his ministry. Let me just say, and as you pause to think about some of the various people that God's brought into your life, aren't you thankful for those who made a difference in your life? There are people all across our paths and different locations, different regions, and some have uh, been influential in uh, helping to shape, mold us into who we are today, and others perhaps helped us and molded us to not become like they were and, and uh, redirected. But God brought all of these different people into our lives, and we find the same to be true here with the lives of Aquila and Priscilla, men that, uh, a couple that God's going to bring into the life of Paul. As soon as Paul got there, the Bible says that he found a certain Jew named Aquila. I, obviously, when you consider the size of the city of Corinth and uh, all of the, the people that are there, this was not just some accidental discovery. Uh, God doesn't do oopses in life, okay? Okay. 
Uh, God doesn't make mistakes. God doesn't have things and think, oh, wow, you know what? Paul's arriving in Corinth and, oh, man, I did not schedule his airport run pickup, okay? Uh, God doesn't do those things. God sovereignly directed Paul to these, this couple. How he did so, we're never told. But it formed a, the basis of a friendship that would last the remainder of his life. How they arrived at Corinth is really pretty amazing. It says that Aquila was a man who was born in Pontus. Pontus was uh, a region, if you've got your map, it may be on the map. I don't remember where I cropped the uh, screen off. But uh, if you've got the map, Pontus was the region uh, in Asia Minor, which would be modern day Turkey. And it was located, it's a region up in the north along the Black Sea. That's where he was born. Well, he ended up living in Rome, Italy. That's a long way away, okay? Uh, a very long way away. How he got there, we don't know. Maybe his parents moved there, I don't know. Maybe uh, he heard Priscilla lived there and he loved Priscilla and so he moved to Rome to be with Priscilla. We don't know, but for some, somehow he got from a location that if we were at Corinth, he got from a location far to the east, way to the other side, far to the west, and he lived there in Rome. But they found themselves as a couple in the midst of political turmoil. Sound familiar? Okay. I don't care which candidate you uh, vote for, and actually I do care, but uh, it takes uh, uh, anybody to, to sit there and realize we are in an absolute mess as a nation. It's reflected in virtually every area of, of who we are. And Aquila and Priscilla found themselves in a very similar situation. They found themselves under the reign of an emperor named Claudius. He was the fourth Roman emperor and reigned for a total of 13 years. He followed an emperor by the name of Caius, also known as Caligula, who had offended the Jews a lot. In fact, what he did was he decided that it would be very fitting for him to have his own statue right in the middle of Jerusalem. To any Jew, this would be a great offense. And uh, he did so, and uh, he erects his own statue, and, and or right in the center of Rome, rather, I said Jerusalem, right in the center of Rome. Well, Claudius began to go back to some of the previous policies and actually allowed the Jews a fair amount of freedom to worship, but especially the Jews from Alexandria, which is going to be way down in Egypt. He did that because there was a political relationship, a man by the name of Herod Agrippa. This would be the grandson uh, of Herod the Great. Herod Agrippa was the one responsible for executing James in Acts chapter number 12. Well, Herod Agrippa and Claudius, Herod kind of helped Claudius get his seat. And in return for that, Claudius gave him all of the territory in Judea that his grandfather had owned and, and had reigned over. So he went over there, and that's when James ends up being executed. So, of course, now politically, we're going to show favoritism towards these. What about these other ones? Well, eventually, Claudius, and I do not know the all of the reasons behind it, but Claudius determined that the Jews could no longer live in Rome. Now we can read through that parentheses there in verse number two rather easily. Claudius had commanded all Jews to depart from Rome. I'll read through it and really think very little of it. But all of a sudden, Aquila and Priscilla found themselves being banished from their own home. Now, I don't know about you, but I hate moving. I hate it. I hate it with a passion. I think in our first four years, five years of marriage, I think we moved every year. Oh, it was ridiculous. It wasn't because I kept 
forgetting to pay the rent and kept getting kicked out, okay? But, uh, you know, the first house was a, a one-bedroom house. Well, along came Abby, and a one-bedroom house was not going to work. So then it's a, a, a duplex. Well, then came an opportunity at, at work uh, for a much bigger house. Oh, that was kind of nice, because then we didn't have to listen to the neighbor through our walls. So uh, we took advantage of that. Well, then came uh, an opportunity to go to a nicer place, and, and we were there and, and didn't have to pay anything. We were able to save up to purchase our home here and uh, up in this area. I hate moving. There were boxes of stuff that I think were packed in the very first house that uh, for the longest time were still unpacked in our own home here. Well, eventually, uh, through various circumstances, we basically got rid of that. If I hadn't opened the box in 10 years, I probably didn't need it. Uh, but if you have ever moved, you understand the misery of that. It is amazing how much valuable stuff I collect and how much junk my wife collects, okay? Uh, everything that I own is essential and everything that I own is needed. It's valuable. There, there's great value there. And the stuff she collects is insane. And the junk that all of that goes, she's uh, back there about to turn my microphone off, so I'm going to change gears here very quickly. Uh, but we're about to watch the record button stop that. But nonetheless, uh, obviously, you, you begin to collect a whole lot of stuff. And if you've been in any location for any length of time, you know the amount of stuff you've got. All right, the uh, thought of moving oh, is just absolutely dreaded. Imagine being a Christian who is forced through a political decree to relocate. That's what Aquila and Priscilla experienced. But you know, this decree did not take God by surprise in the least bit. You see, God is ultimately the one who is in charge. Now, there are many leaders of this world who think that they are in charge, and sadly, all of them are wrong. The Bible reminds us in Proverbs chapter 21 and verse 1 that the king's heart is in the hand of the Lord. And as the rivers of water, he turneth it whithersoever he will. God takes and, and he simply redirects the heart of the various rulers to accomplish whatever his divine plan is. Amen. God is the one ultimately who is in charge and God is fulfilling his eternal decrees. There's not a, a president, there's not a king uh, in this world who is going to override what God has already decreed. Their heart is simply in God's hand. Now, how God directs and how God turns and why God turns and why God allows, that is beyond oftentimes what you and I are capable of understanding. But God does so. And he directs and turns and, and moves it however he wants to. And if he wants that heart to turn to the right, he'll turn that heart to the right. And if he wants it to go to the left, he'll turn it to the left. An example of it is Cyrus the Great. When he assumed the throne, all of a sudden he said, you know what, I'm going to let the Jews go back to Jerusalem. He didn't come up with that idea. God had said they would be in captivity for 70 years. He was the beginning of that. God used him and motivated his heart to redirect them. In fact, he funded the material project to rebuild the streets of Jerusalem. God did all of that. None of this took God by surprise. God knew from eternity past that this meeting between Paul and Aquila and Priscilla would ultimately occur. And he providentially directed them to Corinth. And if you take a straight line, and we say as the crow flies, and go from Rome to Corinth, and you can't travel that way, but if you go that way, it's over 600 miles just to get there. If you sail down the western coast of Italy and around the boot and eventually over to the city of Corinth, you're on a journey that's over a thousand miles. Those things don't happen overnight. God used these circumstances and God allowed this emperor to make this kind of a decree. God providentially directed Aquila and Priscilla. That is from God's perspective. But let's look at the flip side of the same coin. Let's see it from Aquila and Priscilla's perspective. 
all of a sudden they're being forced to do something. Maybe they saw it coming, maybe they didn't. I don't know whether the political scene had reached a point where they pretty well were able to predict that this was going to take place and they had already begun to pray. I have no idea how it happened. But all of a sudden they found themselves virtually expelled from their own home. They were not given an option. This isn't one of these situations of uh, a boss saying, well, would you like to take this position? It would require a move and you're given an option. This is a no option. You're gone from here. But you know what you do not find? You do not find them embittered by it. You find them instead embracing what God directed into their lives. They went to Corinth. I don't know how they got to Corinth. I don't know what the appeal was to Corinth. I don't know. Uh, How far would you have left Rome? Just get outside of the, the, the city limits, per se, of Rome? You know, I don't know. Some of us would have done that out of spite. <laughs> Pitched a tent right on the city line. Ha, 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 ha. You know, uh, that, they go to Corinth. How they got there and what led them there, I do not know. But you know what? When they got there, they chose to embrace what God directed into their lives. Did they understand it all at the time? Probably not. But they chose to embrace it. Can I tell you that there are times when God redirects us in ways we don't understand? In ways we simply do not comprehend? I know we can quote Romans 8, 28 and say we know that all things work together for good, but to be quite honest with you, there are many things that I've experienced in life and I don't see the good in that. I don't even see how God took it. I don't understand why God allowed that. But it's not for me to understand the whys. It's for me to simply trust Him and to commit my way to Him to lean not on my own understanding because my understanding is flawed. My understanding is limited and God has a plan that is infinitely greater than you and I will ever be able to comprehend. God's in control and His way is always going to be best. Well, here comes this Young man, now we look at Paul and we think, my goodness, you know, Paul, uh, I mean, did Paul even sin? Well, we know from Romans 7 that he did. But of all the people who are intimidating to read about, as far as an example, Paul is one of them, okay? Uh, He seems to be on a spiritual level that that very few individuals that that we would even know. And And in some ways it's intimidating. You know, Paul was just a normal person. And here comes this guy by the name of Paul. Now we look at him and say, oh, wow. He's just a person. And you know what? Aquila and Priscilla began to minister to Paul. The Bible says that he came unto them, verse number 2, and because he was of the same craft, he abode with them. He lived with them. This isn't a three-bedroom house upstairs and a a downstairs with its own kitchen suite and bathroom and all of that. The inconvenience of all of this. You see how they opened themselves up to be able to minister? They had no idea what Paul would end up doing. They had no idea the impact that Paul and his life would have on Christianity. They didn't sit there and think, wow, you know what? We got a chance to get, uh, you know what? Yeah, he's going to write nearly half of the New Testament. Let's go ahead and have him in our homes. Maybe he'll put our names in there too. Think about this. Uh, this, is, this is a great person and we'll be able to, to make a difference in his life and, and all of that. That's not what happened. Paul had no idea. Or Aquila and Priscilla had no idea. But you know what they did? They accepted God's direction and they chose to embrace it. And let me point out to you, there's a lot of difference between accepting something and embracing something. Um, I recall several years ago having hernia surgery. I accepted that reality, but I can assure you I did not embrace the reality. I did not sit there and say, this is going to be great. 
I can't wait. This is, this is going to be fun. I accepted it. Did I accept it with a welcoming spirit? Uh, no. What about embracing God's plan for your life? And those people that God brings into your life for a reason. Why? You've got an opportunity to make a difference in that person's life. Take and embrace the opportunities that God gives you. So Paul chose to work. The word is wrought in the King James. What's it mean? He worked. Day in and day out, Paul worked. Exciting, isn't it? It's what he did. Why? They were of the same occupation. They were both tent makers. I'm not sure how they went through that process. I can assure you it was not like it is today. Okay? The way that tents are made today and, and all the sewing machines. And uh, if you've ever purchased a tent, isn't it amazing how big of a tent they can put in a small package? Okay? And they vacuum seal the life out of that thing. And if you take that tent out of that package, good luck getting it back in there. I assure you, if you're camping somewhere, you'd better have another bigger bag because that tent isn't going back in there the same way that it came out. Try all you want. It isn't going to happen. That's not how they made tents. I don't know how they did, but that's what Paul did. Later on, I'm not going to take the time to turn to it, Paul testifies when he writes to the church at Corinth that he didn't receive any money from them. And he did so, so that he would be able to minister to them, so that he wouldn't be able to have any kind of an accusation of taking advantage of them or anything like that. That's in 2 Corinthians 11, and I'm not going to take uh, the time to turn there. point of it is this, here's a friendship that was begun. Why? Because people followed God's leading. I don't always understand it. I don't understand why God closes doors and opens doors. I don't understand sometimes the doors God closes or why he closes them. But I know this, his way is always best. I don't understand why God allows certain political leaders to always seem to capture the forefront of our nation. God knows what's best. God may be using those as uh, an agent to, to turn us back to him. I have no idea what God's doing, nor do I have to know. I just simply have to trust him. And I have to follow him and do the next step that I know to be right. And when I do that, the next step will take care of itself. I've said many times, God's will is not about doing, it's about being. And so when you wake up tomorrow... You be the person you need to be as far as the Word of God is concerned. And when you are the person that you're to be day in and day out, you will find yourself where you're supposed to be, doing what you're supposed to be doing. Embrace God's plan for your life. Let's move on into verse number four, and we find not only a friendship begun, but we also find a message rejected he reasoned in the synagogue, the Bible says, every Sabbath and persuaded the Jews and the Greeks. And when Silas and Timotheus were come from Macedonia, Paul was pressed in the spirit and testified to the Jews that Jesus was Christ. I'm going to stop the reading there because in addition to his physical labor as he uh, was a tent maker, he also engaged in ministry. And once again, he starts with the Jews. And he starts with the Jews where he typically has in a synagogue every single Sabbath. And there was a point in the order of service where any kind of visiting teacher or speaker would be given the opportunity uh, to be able to, to preach and so or teach. And Paul did so. And he reasoned, the Bible says, or he repeatedly discussed, he repeatedly engaged in conversation with them every single Sabbath. The Bible says that he persuaded the Jews and the Greeks. The word persuaded suggests that he caused them to come to a particular point of view on something. Now, whether he uh, it's describing the attempt or whether it's describing the success of persuading them uh, is unclear. It seems that it was more the attempt because the Jews are going to later on reject the message of Paul. But Paul continued on and many also end up being saved. So I don't know which way we necessarily take this, but either way, this was his goal. I need to get these people to understand this reality of who God is, of who Jesus Christ is, and of what he's done. 
Well, eventually the ministry was enhanced by the arrival of Silas and Timothy. You recall they had been left behind at Berea. Paul escaped there uh, in the, really in the early, I believe it was, that one was in the middle of the night, if I'm thinking correctly. And, and uh, there were individuals who were responsible for getting Paul to safety, and they took him all the way down to Athens. And Paul and, and, and rather Silas and Timothy uh, were left behind. He got there, and I don't think his stay was as long in Athens as he intended. Because he intended to meet Silas and Timothy there. If that didn't happen, he ended up meeting uh, Silas and Timothy in Corinth. And how all of that worked out, I have no idea. You know, it's not that uh, uh, Silas and Timothy woke up and checked their email to see where Paul was. Um, yeah, obviously, they, they probably went to Athens and heard from some of the believers that he went west. Oh, great. <laughs> Let's keep chasing Paul. I mean, here he is having to flee from all these various cities. How far are we going to chase him? Before long, we're going to end up going who knows where. Well, eventually they find him. They find him in Corinth. And uh, the Bible says they come from Macedonia. That's northern Greece. And the Bible says Paul was pressed in the spirit. He testified to the Jews that Jesus was Christ. The word press suggests that, that Paul was urged in doing this. He was given uh, the impulse to engage in something. Most of us have experienced uh, times when God's prompted our minds to do something. Maybe we're sitting beside someone and, and our minds begin thinking, you know, I really should witness to that person. That's what we're talking about. Paul was, was pressed in the Spirit. And as soon as we sense that, we have to respond in obedience. Oftentimes we respond arguing. Well, this isn't a very good time. Um, not really sure what a good time would be. Um, we're experts at determining when it's not an opportune time, right? Are you with me on this? Yes, no, yes, okay. We're pretty good at saying, yeah, this just isn't the time. Okay. Let me challenge you with this thinking. Define what the time is. Because you're pretty good at recognizing what it's not. If you're so good at recognizing what it's not, we should be experts at recognizing when it really is. More often than not, our idea this isn't a good time is more of an excuse and an arguing with God, I don't want to do this. Um, but if, if you are an expert of determining this isn't the right time, then you need to also be the expert of determining when the right time is. Paul was urged, he was prompted by the Holy Spirit to declare a message to these Jews. Jesus was Christ. Still is. Jesus is Christ, this man, Jesus, there's his uh, name given to him, the one who will save from your sins. He was Christ, the anointed one, the Messiah. You crucified, the Jews crucified him. And so Paul was sitting there and he was prompted, I need to give this message. He was pressed in the spirit that, that Jesus was the Messiah. And so he testified to that fact. He made a solemn declaration about this. this. The truth, he declared the truth. Jesus is Christ, he's the Messiah. Oftentimes we think, well, you know, if I obey God, then I'm going to get favorable results. I'm being prompted to witness to this person beside me. That must mean he's about to get saved and God's directed me. I see it all. So I'm going to start witnessing to him. And then he doesn't get saved. See, God, that was a waste of time. Told you it wasn't the right time. That's why I don't do these things, God. Here I am, I'm getting embarrassed. Here we are, now he's starting to raise his voice, and we're here in the doctor's office, and you're not supposed to be raising your voice in the doctor's office. We're on an airplane, there's nowhere else we can go, God, I shouldn't have done this. Maybe I misdirected it. And we sense, well, God's leading then means I'm going to get favorable results. Not always. Sometimes people simply need to hear the truth of where they are in their relationship to God. And it doesn't always bring out a favorable response when they oppose themselves and blasphemed. They began to reject everything that he had, uh, had stated. They actively resisted it. And then the Bible says they blasphemed. doesn't mean that they cursed God. What it means is that they slandered Paul. Well, that's not very nice. 
Why do I have to listen to this? Uh, you know what? I'm, I'm not, I don't have to listen to this. You know what? You stop, be quiet. <laughs> I'm not going to share anymore. I, I deserve better. Began slandering Paul. Well, Paul did respond. And it's interesting how he responded. He shook his raiment and said unto them, Your blood be upon your own heads. I am clean, from henceforth I will go unto the Gentiles. Why did he shake his clothes? <laughs> well, he stand up and say, you know what? Fine. Okay, is this the picture of it? When you go back into the commission of the 12 apostles. Jesus provided them with a lot of different instruction and things they were to take and things they weren't to take. And he warned them. He warned them about the, the reality of what it was that they were facing. I'm sending you as sheep in the midst of wolves. <laughs> People are not always going to be favorable towards the message of Christianity. The same is true today. Uh, just hang around at Christmas time. Okay. And uh, you'll see this once again come to the forefront of our, of our country. Well, Jesus, when he commissioned the 12 apostles, he instructed them, Whosoever shall not receive you, nor hear your words, when ye depart out of that house or city, shake off the dust of your feet. That was an act that saying he is then clean and pure from this. Verily I say unto you, it should be more tolerable for the land of Sodom and Gomorrah in the day of judgment than for that city. Wow. That is an incredible statement. Sodom and Gomorrah in many ways to us is the epitome of God's wrath, his anger, his judgment, and all of that. And what he says is, all right, if they're going to reject you, then you go on and shake off the dust of your feet. It's an act that declares the person who is witnessing to be innocent. And it is furthermore an act that pronounces judgment and condemnation upon those who the act is done. Paul has shared with them the truth. They have the responsibility to respond to the truth. I can only do so much. I can tell a person, you know what, the only way that you can be saved is through the death of Jesus Christ on the cross and placing your trust in Him. I can point to the Scripture passage that says, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man cometh unto the Father but by me. There is only one way to God. I can share that and I can do so till I'm blue in the face. I can do so with great passion. I can do so uh, with great compassion. All of those things. I can do so in response to God's leading. But when it all comes down to it, you are responsible for the truth and what you are going to do with it. And every time you open the Word of God to read it and study it for your own, you are confronted with the truth of what God says. You're responsible for that. Not me. I'm responsible on our services to, to properly teach and properly instruct you in the Word of God. But you're responsible for what you do with it. And these individuals chose to reject that. And Paul, in essence, is saying, you know what? I'm clean from this. I'm not going to be accountable for your response. Now, what if Paul had not responded in obedience to the prompting? He would be accountable. Let me point out, and I hear this a lot, people will die and go to hell because so-and-so did not obey and, and accept and go on with the truth of the Word of God. Uh, let's say that a missionary, for example, is... Uh, senses his leading to go to a foreign country and he does not do so, then countless people are going to spend an eternity in hell. I think that is a little bit of an overestimation of our own importance in things. All right? God is not going to condemn a nation to hell because I chose to disobey. God can use whatever means necessary to save that nation. He can use rocks, for crying out loud. He's, using, he's used donkeys to communicate messages to people. 
okay, or to a person, let's say it that way. Uh, I know of not many people who have had a donkey talking to them, uh, but Balaam had that. Uh, I know of people who have talked to animals in response, and it was quite the conversation Balaam had, but my point is that, that God used that. God can use whatever means necessary. The problem is if I choose to disobey, then I lose the blessing and I lose the reward of that, okay? But it does not mean that someone is condemned to an eternity in hell, okay? God can take and send someone else there. I just lose the reward of obedience and proper fellowship and, and that so forth. Point of it is this, Paul did what he was prompted to do, but the message wasn't favorable. So he said, I am clean. And you have chosen to reject the truth. I'm guiltless. You can't put this on me. I told you the truth. And tragically, many people sit in a church Sunday after Sunday after Sunday after Sunday. They've been told the truth of the Word of God, and yet they choose to reject it. And you know what's even more interesting? Many times it's the pastor's fault. Really? Now, sometimes we say things in an improper manner. That is our fault. Okay, I'm not saying that. But a person who is told, you know what? If you don't accept Jesus Christ as your Savior, you're not going to spend an eternity in heaven. I don't like that man. This was what Paul, in essence, is, is dealing with. I, I'm, I'm clean from this. I'm guiltless. And then he makes this declaration from henceforth, from this point, I will go into the Gentiles. The Jews in the city of Corinth rejected the message. Now, does that mean Paul never witnessed to another Jew? No. In the city of Corinth, though, his focus of his ministry changed. Does that mean that uh, if Paul passed a Jew in the streets, he wouldn't greet them? No. Is Paul nasty in his disposition now towards the entire Jewish population in Corinth? I don't think so. If a Jew expressed a desire to be saved, would he? Yes. Okay, I don't think Paul would say, nope, nope. Can't do that. You're a Jew. Okay. But as a nation and the focus of his ministry, the focus of his ministry changed. Goes on, verse number seven, we find a message accepted. He departed thence and entered into a certain man's house named Justice, one that worshiped God, whose house joined hard to the synagogue. And Crispus, the chief ruler of the synagogue, believed in the Lord and all his house, and many of the Corinthians hearing believed and were baptized. Here's Justice, or uh, some of you may see Justin. Uh, in fact, others may very well see Titius, T-I-T-I-U-S in the, in the Bible. That's, uh, without getting into a whole lot of technical stuff, that's taken out of a, a different manuscript than the King James is translated from. And so those so who will do that, then will put a reference to Romans 16, 22 with a man by the name of Tertius. And they'll throw all that together and say this is the same person. It's taken uh, from a different manuscript, and that's neither here nor there, but anyway, if you see that and have a question as to why, that's the why. Well, here comes a man by the name of Justice, and he entered into Justice's house. Justice received him. Once again, you find this willingness to be able to minister to people. The Bible describes him as one that worshiped God. He was a proselyte. He uh, was a religious person doesn't necessarily mean that he was automatically saved. He certainly was sympathetic towards Paul and his ministry. The Bible says his house joined hard to the synagogue. Uh, we would say his house was adjacent to the synagogue. Okay? It was connected to it. It does not mean that his household was uh, firmly entrenched in the traditions of the synagogue. It just means structurally it was connected. And he also, we're introduced to a man by the name of Crispus. Kind of a neat little name. Uh, Crispus was the chief ruler of the synagogue. He was the leader of the synagogue. It was his job to ensure the order of the service was upheld. He was the, I might say, the leader of the synagogue, responsible for everything that occurred within it. The Bible says that here was this religious person. He's the leader of the synagogue. Keep this in mind. 
This isn't just the person who's attending. He's the person who's conducting the synagogue. He's very religious. Um, I struggle to, to use the comparison, but I will like a, a, a pastor of a church. Okay? He was there in that position. But you know what? He was unsaved. Isn't it interesting? Because he, the Bible says, believed on the Lord. He heard the message of salvation and realized that salvation was not found in keeping the religion of Judaism. There are many, many religious people today. Christianity is not a religion, it's a relationship. There's a lot of difference there. It's not about doing certain things and, and being able to hope that when I get to heaven, I'm going to have my, my good deeds outweigh my bad deeds. That's not it. You'll lose. The only way is through Jesus Christ. And Crispus came to that realization and he believed on the Lord. And so did his entire house. Everybody within his household got saved. That means everybody made the individual decision to accept Jesus Christ as their Savior. Now they weren't saved because Crispus was saved. They were saved because they individually believed Jesus Christ to be the Savior of the world. And then the Bible says that he, uh, many of the Corinthians, hearing, believed and were baptized. They heard the truth of the gospel and many of them were saved and many of them were baptized. Crispus comes to find in 1 Corinthians chapter 1 and verse 14, there were only two people out of this whole group that, Chris, that Paul actually baptized. One was Crispus. The other was a man by the name of Gaius, and he was thankful for that because uh, that way nobody would be able to say that they belonged to his school of thought. And that was dealing with a division that occurred within the church at Corinth later on in 1 Corinthians chapter 1. Their response was vastly different than the response of the Jews. The Jews rejected the message. They ridiculed the messenger. But the Gentiles accepted it, and they were saved. The choice is up to you. We've been studying in our Wednesday nights through the book of Hebrews and chapter number 10 currently where individuals are faced with the reality of it's either Christ or it's judgment. And as the writer of Hebrews reminds us, it's a fearful thing to fall into the hands of the living God. There are only two options. There's no third door. There may be unsaved people who reject the message we proclaim. We want to be sure that we do so properly. I know there are times where our disposition is not proper. There are times when my disposition is not proper. I know I find it hard to believe, but occasionally I get frustrated. <laughs> And uh, sometimes that comes out. Uh, there are times where I get sarcastic. That comes out far more than it needs to come out. Uh, and, you know, my response, somebody being difficult towards me, is sometimes not what it needs to be. Well, we don't want to have that. We don't want that kind of an offense to be the reason that someone rejects the gospel. Okay? But at the same point, and, and, and let me just tell you, love people. <laughs> Uh, you'll, you'll find a, you get a whole lot more when you just love people. Uh, yeah, they're going to make some foolish decisions. So do you, day in and day out, if you're not remembering that. Love people. But what you'll find is that there will be some who will accept it. And there will be others who reject it. And you may be prompted to hand someone a track. They may tear it up and laugh. Don't throw it back in their face. Okay, excuse me, you, you dropped this. <laughs> excuse me, you tore this up into millions of pieces. Here's all these little pieces. I didn't want to litter your parking lot with them so, and drop them on their couch. Don't do that kind of stuff. Stick your foot in the door when they're trying to close it. That's never a good idea, all right? And they open the door, tell them you're a hellbound sinner. <laughs> okay, that's probably not going to accomplish a lot. But understand that when you respond in obedience to him, you may experience the blessing of seeing fruit. You may experience the challenge of rejection and mockery. Folks, things are not going to get easier in our country. I 
do believe that. They can. We can turn our eyes back to the Lord. There's no doubt about that. But if we continue on the direction we're going, we're going to be faced with some very difficult times. We will reach, if we continue on at this direction and at this pace, we will find to be a challenge to be a Christian in the United States of America. And we're going to be faced with that reality. Let's not be nasty in our disposition, okay? But let's take our stands, take them boldly, and do so with a proper demeanor. And when the truth of the Word of God is clear, folks, we take our stand. We don't make any apologies for it, and we let the chips fall. I want to be sure again we do so in the proper demeanor. And we'll be faced with, I'm afraid, many of these challenges. We share the truth of the Word of God, and we leave the results in their hand, in God's hands. It may be that you're struggling with how God's directing in the way in which He's leading or the direction in which He's leading. Maybe there's a Paul that you need to minister to. I don't know. Are you willing to be the Aquila or the Priscilla and minister to those kinds of people? We pray for opportunities to reach out to people. We pray for opportunities to minister. And then we find someone who's got, yeah, they just got too many needs. Can't minister to them. You see, the opportunities are there. It's a matter of us taking and, and doing properly what needs to be done. I don't always understand God's leading, but I know it's always best. And aren't you thankful that there's not a ruler in this world who will ever exceed what God has decreed? God said it, and God's going to bring it to pass. With or without that ruler, we serve an amazing God. The musicians come forward. I'm going to ask the most important question that you'll ever answer, and that's this. If you were to pass away today, where would you spend in eternity? I know beyond a shadow of a doubt that I will be spending mine in heaven, and I hope you are as well. If there's any degree of doubt or uncertainty, or you simply know that's not the case, we're going to have a song of invitation here in just a minute. I want to encourage you to step out and come forward and let me share with you the truth of the Word of God and how you can know beyond a shadow of a doubt that your home is in heaven. Those of you who are saved, we sang a lot of songs on God's directing. How well are you doing at submitting to His leading? It's a challenge, especially when we don't understand it. It's easy when we understand it. Oh, okay, God, you'd like for me to go to the bank and cash the million-dollar check. Oh, Lord, I'm really struggling with this one. I just don't know. <laughs> Those are easy ones. But when we don't understand it, boy, is it hard. I don't know how many years elapsed with Aquila and Priscilla from the time they were expelled out of Rome to the time they got to Corinth and the time that Paul came. I have no idea. But it isn't interesting how God brought two people from opposite ends right to the city of Corinth and it formed a friendship that lasted for a lifetime. I have no idea that who God's wanting you to minister to. But I want to encourage you to stand in that gap and be that kind of person that they need. Let's stand.